So we're going to compare again solids, liquids, and gases. We've looked at this before. This table compares um, the three states of water. Uh, the gas state, we call it steam. Liquid state, what we usually refer to as water. And the solid state, we usually call ice. If you look at the densities, uh, the density of steam is much, much lower than the density of liquid water or ice. Serious pointer issues. I'm going to give up. Um, and if you look at the molar volume, the volume of one mole of steam, water, and ice, again, the liquid and the solid are similar, and the gas is quite different. And here we have illustrations of what the molecules look like. Now this, this picture here of the gas is actually not to scale. If the atom, if the molecules were that size, a picture like this would only have part of a molecule in it. So they kind of zoomed out a little bit so we could see. The molecules in the liquid and the, and the solid are touchingly close. They're actually touching each other, but there's a lot of space between molecules in the gas state. Any questions? Okay, a major difference, we, we, we just looked at how solids and liquids are, are similar in some ways, right? A big difference, though, is the freedom of movement of the particles. So in a liquid, the particles have enough energy, thermal energy, to overcome the stickiness between them, and so they can slide around. Whereas particles in a solid are fixed relative to the particle next to them. They're vibrating, but they're not moving around. Sometimes I like to think of intermolecular forces as being a bit like Velcro. So imagine a crowd of people and everyone's wearing Velcro suits, right? And they're really close and they're, they're brushing against each other. If, if they don't move with enough energy, they're just going to stick to each other, right? And you get a bunch of people who are just all stuck by their Velcro suits. In order to be able to move past, they're going to have to move more quickly, right, to, to break the Velcro. So what we see for, um, for liquids and solids, they have high density um, and they have definite volume. Their volumes don't change. But the shape is different. A solid has a definite shape, whereas a liquid will take on the shape of its container. I don't know what's up with my pointer. So liquids assume the shapes of their containers. Gases do also, but gases also assume the volume of their container. Gases are compressible. Liquids and solids are usually not compressible. You can think of solids that are compressible like, oh, a sponge. I can squeeze a sponge, right? Well, what you're doing is you're squeezing the air out of a sponge. Um, a true solid is, is only marginally compressible, if at all. So here you've got a liquid. Um, represented by these little green atoms. And you put pressure on that, but the atoms are already as close as they can get. And so it's not going to compress much, if at all. This is the, the basis or the theory behind hydraulic systems, where you have a liquid in some sort of a, a tube or a conduit. And you put pressure on one side, and it transfers the pressure through all sorts of squiggles and everything to the other side. That's why you don't want air in your gas lines because the air is compressible. And you step on the gas, did I say gas lines? Brake lines, brake lines. You don't, want, you don't want air in your gas lines either, but that's something else, in your brake lines. Put your foot on the brake. You want the brake fluid to transfer the force to the brakes. You don't want that to be used compressing air. In, an, in a gas, there's lots of space between the molecules. And so you put some pressure on this piston and you can squeeze it down, you know, just pushing those guys closer together. How the particles in a solid are arranged falls into two broad categories, crystalline solids and amorphous. Crystalline solids have regular ordered structures. So here's an example. There's, there's a pattern here. Everything's nice and ordered in three dimensions. Amorphous means without shape. Here, the particles are just all jumbled together. We're familiar with 
state changes due to temperature. If you put an ice cube in a beaker and you heat it, it will melt into liquid. If you take that liquid and maybe you stick it on a hot plate, you can heat it and cause it to go into the gas state. And the opposite is true. You take the gas and cool it. We did that in experiment 5A. We cooled the gas and it liquefied. You can also take that liquid and cool it more and freeze it. But we can also have state changes that are due to pressure changes, not just temperature. So here's a diagram of a propane tank, a liquid propane tank. It's actually liquefied petroleum, but it's mostly propane. So they put propane in here, and it's under a lot of pressure, and so that causes it to be a liquid. This is a more efficient way of transporting and storing LP gas because it takes up so much less space. So what happens when you open this and let some gas into your grill is there's some gas in the um, LP gas and gas, so then that gets confusing. I'm going to call it propane. There is some propane in the gas state. When you open this, that propane escapes, and some of this then evaporates to replace what escaped. So a change in pressure can cause um, a liquid to evaporate or a, a gas to condense. Um, it, it's usually the, the gas, the molecules at the surface that'll go into the gas state. It's not going to suddenly start boiling. But it, as you let, there will be gas particles, propane in the gas state, up here above the liquid. And when those leave, then some of these molecules in the liquid state will evaporate into the gas state and replace them. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about vapor pressure.